Hi. In this lecture, we are going to cover chapter one, Introduction to Physics. Uh, we're going to talk about what physics is and then um, uh, units and dimensions of length, mass, time. We will do some dimensional analysis and then we will talk about significant figures, converting units, and also some, we are going to make some order of magnitude calculations and I will also talk about spherical cows. These lectures are based on the textbook, Physics by James Walker, fifth edition. Physics and the laws of nature. The root meaning of the word physics is natural things. There's order in nature designed and governed by the creator, which we call the laws of physics. You can look at the atoms, you can look at the sun and the earth system, and you will see order, mathematical order in whichever scale you look at. So there is a mathematical order in nature. So we use math to model the laws of nature so that we can predict its future behavior accurately and precisely. The working principles of cars, planes, human body, and the solar system, smartphones, microwaves, atoms, etc., boils down to just a few fundamental principles. These principles are like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, or things like that light travels with the speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. It's really amazing that from uh, cars to planes to, at to atoms, like these are all different things, but we can explain all of these things really in terms of just a couple of fundamental principles. That's the power and beauty of physics. Learning physics. Learning physics is not really hard. No special powers are needed. The material that I'm going to show you has conceptual and mathematical parts. In the exams or when you do science or engineering, both skills will be tested and used. You cannot fly with one wing. Physical intuition develops in time. Just like building any skill, any skill requires time and dedication, just like playing an instrument. You can know all the notes and how the instrument is played, but if you want to play a song, then you have to practice a lot. You can't learn physics just a few days before the exam. Also, your brain won't get wired enough if you don't practice enough. So the solution is, the cure for that is solve dozens of physics problems. That's the only way to get your brain wired for physics. Physical quantities are expressed in terms of dimensions of length, mass, and time. Quantities like velocity, acceleration, momentum, energy, power, pressure, etc., can be expressed by proper combinations of length, mass, and time dimensions. For example, take speed. So if it's in units of kilometers per hour, so or in it could be meters per second, doesn't matter. The dimensions of speed is always length divided by time. Maybe you remember this formula speed is x divided by t. So it's length, this sign, these parentheses, they mean dimension. So it's length divided by time. What about energy? Well, it's mass times length squared times squared. Let's look at the formula for kinetic energy. It's one half mv squared. m is mass, v is length divided by time, but it's squared, and these length and time here are squared. So these are dimensions, and they're also units, like kilogram, grams, tons, meters. So in these lectures, we will use SI units. SI means international system of units. In SI, the unit of length is meter. So if you are using physics formulas for meters for any distance, uh, you have to use meters. If you are given a quantity, a distance in kilometers, 
or centimeters, you should always convert them to meters first and then plug them into the, into the formulas. The unit of mass is kilogram. So you don't use grams or tons in the formulas. So you have to convert them into kilograms. And the unit of time is second. So not a minute, not an hour. You should use second when you use the physics formulas. Physics problems can be solved by using any unit system, not necessarily the SI unit system. SI units is just an agreed upon convention, but of course there are other unit systems as well. Certain words that we use in daily life do not mean the same thing in the context of physics. For example, in daily life, if you say powerful, then it may mean a powerful person could be a rich person or uh, a muscular person, but in, in the context of physics, power has a very precise definition and meaning, which means energy per time. So let's talk about mass and weight. Mass is the amount of matter and its dimension is m. One mole of carbon is 12 grams. So one mole means approximately six times 10 to the 23 atoms, right? Carbon atoms. It, its mass is 20 grams, and it doesn't change. The mass doesn't change if you go, to, you know, if you go from the Earth to the moon. It's the same. On the other hand, weight is a force, and its dimension is mass times length divided by time squared. So if you want to calculate weight of something, you have to multiply their mass with the gravitational constant. So maybe you remember this, weight equals m times g. m is the same, it doesn't change. It's the mass, it's the amount of ma matter. But g changes, g is on the Earth, it's approximately 9.8 meter per second squared. But on the moon, let me put E here. On the moon, G moon is, it's approximately um, G E, the value 9.8 divided by six, approximately. So that's why when you go to the moon, if you step up on a scale, your weight will be six times less. Okay. So your mass, which is the amount of matter, does not change when you go to the moon because you, know, you are the same you, the number of atoms in you is the same. But your weight does change when you go to the moon. The reason is that the gravitational constant is different on the earth and the moon. So you have to know these definitions very well in the context of physics. And in daily life, probably, you know, we use these interchangeably, but in physics, they have specific and precise definitions. Dimensional analysis is about examining the dimensions of a physical quantity in terms of length, mass, and time. So first of all, numbers, they don't have any dimensions, 7, 99, or any other number. They are dimensionless. Now, what about the other physical quantities? For example, distance. Well, it's in dimensions of length. The area is in dimensions of length squared. Volume is in dimensions of length cubed. Acceleration and velocity, we talked about them, and also the energy. So they are, so whichever quantity that you can think of, think of in physics, they are expressed in terms of length, time and mass dimensions. So from the table, you can see that velocity is related to, so let's say you don't know, you don't remember the formula for velocity, which is x divided by t. But if you know the dimensions, let's say I give you velocity five meter per second. Now the dimensions is length, divided by time. So from that, you can actually find this formula, right? Because length is x and time is t, and this is velocity. 
So even if you don't remember the formulas or even if like you don't know the formulas at all, so you can even discover formulas by using dimensional analysis. Let's do it for energy as well. So the dimension of energy is mass length squared time squared. So from that, you can say it's mass times, well, L divided by T is velocity or speed. So you can just take the squ uh, square, square root of it and it will be mass times velocity. Sorry, mass times velocity squared. This sign means proportional to. So the correct formula for, so from here you find something like this, mv squared. But the correct formula is there is one half here. You cannot get that one half from dimensional analysis because you know numbers are dimensionless. We don't know what number it's gonna be from the dimensional analysis. But at least you can get the part that's mv squared part from the dimensional analysis. Okay, let's do this exercise. Use dimensional analysis to find out the missing term in the formula below. So, so if there is an equality, the dimensions on the left hand side and the right hand side, they should match. So what is the dimension of distance? It's length. And what is the dimension of this number? Well, it's dimensionless, I don't have to write it. What about the acceleration? Its dimension is length divided by time squared. Okay, so what should come here? What should be this thing, this term, so that both sides are length in dimensions of length? Well, if this is t squared, then I should have again time squared here so that these would cancel and then I would get length in uh, both sides. So from that, I find that this term should be time squared. So it's gonna be this one. And in the next chapter, we will learn about these kinematics formulas and indeed this is the correct formula. So only from dimensional analysis, you don't have to know how to derive them, but if you know the dimensional analysis, then you can actually you know, find or uh, remember a lot of formulas on your own. Okay, there's one warning here. So do not confuse dimensions and units, okay? Dimensions are length, mass, and time. So each dimension may have different units. For example, length dimension, maybe kilometers, miles, centimeters, and others. For mass, it could be grams, kilograms, it could be tons, and others. And for time, it could be seconds, it could be you know, hours, it could be years, so on and so forth. So do not confuse the concept of dimension and the concept of unit. Okay, another warning. The American decimal separator is, a, is the point, okay? So in these lectures, we adopt the American convention of decimal separator. So we will separate the decimal places with point. So 1.500 means one and a half. So it's like three divided by two. But if I use comma, one comma five zero zero, this means 1,500. It's just, we can also write it like this. So this comma is just helping us to uh, group uh, the number in three digits. It's just so that we can, we can read it easily. But keep in mind, the meaning of dot and comma in Turkey and Europe are the opposite of those in the USA. Okay, let's talk about significant figures. First of all, precision. Precision of any measurement is limited. So precision means how well do you know a measurement? 
or, or how well do you know uh, a quantity? Let's say you are using this ruler and you are going to measure this uh, yellow rectangle. So if you look at here, it's, so this is two, this is 2.5, 2.6, and it's around here, 2.7. So we can say the length of the yellow rectangle is 2.7 centimeters. But what about the other digits, other decimal places here? Can I talk about the other number here, like 2.71, 2.72, 2.7, maybe eight? There is some number here, but the problem is I don't know what that number is. And there's no way that I can find the next decimal place because this ruler is only has the, um, the ticks separated by one millimeter. So that's, my, that's, the, that's the maximum precision I can get, only one millimeter. The second decimal place, so this is the first decimal place. This is the second decimal place. And this is the decimal point, remember. The second decimal place is uncertain, so we don't write it. I mean, there is some number here, but because we don't know it, so we don't write it, it's uncertain. Why? Because we can't measure distances smaller than 0 0.1 centimeter or one millimeter with this particular ruler. If you have another ruler, which has maybe, which is more sensitive, then it, it could be possible to measure, you know, maybe micrometers, but not for this ruler. So for this ruler, the error is approximately 0 0.1 centimeter, or we can say one millimeter. We can talk about precision also uh, in the context of time measurements. So suppose you have a clock that doesn't show, show seconds. So if you look at this clock, you know, usually these clocks, they have a second hand like this, but this one doesn't have, okay? So then this can only report time up to the precision of a minute, not seconds, because we don't really have the second hand here. So in this case, we could say, so for this time, we could report it as 150. So we can't really say what is the second because it doesn't have second hand. And the error would be one minute. Why one minute? Because each ticks here, you can see that, they are separated by one minute. So significant figures, again, this is a special name. It has a special meaning. It's a definition in physics. Um, it means the number of digits in a quantity that are known with certainty. So in the example above, you can report the length of the rectangle as 2.7 centimeters. So it means two significant figures. Well, this point, I mean, this length of this uh, yellow rectangle, it's between two and three. It's not definitely more than three. It's not less than two. So I am 100% sure about this. And also it's, you know, it's just around seven, 2.7. So I can say 2.7, but I cannot really talk about the next decimal. So I can only say things that are, that I am sure about. But of course this, there is an error. This may be uh, a little bit more, a little bit, for example, here, there could be one, or maybe there is nine that would round to 2.8, but I have to stop at this point. Okay, how do we combine two quantities with different precisions? So there are two cases. The first case that I'm gonna talk about is multiplication and division. Let's say you have two numbers and you will either multiply or divide them to each other. So how do you combine like what, so the results should be in how many significant figures? The rule is this, the results should have the same number of significant figures with that of the least accurately known quantity. So probably you're gonna get this from the example. Okay, let's say you're gonna calculate the speed 
by using this formula. So you have to do a division when you are given x and time like these. So when you do the calculation 21.2 divided by 8.5, you get a long number like this in the calculator. Okay, so if I just you know report it like this, it won't be right because I mean how many digits like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten decimal places, but the sensitivity here is not that much, right? So you'll be wrong. So X is given in three significant figures, right? Let's count them. One, two, three. And T is given in two significant figures. One, two. How we calculate the significant figures will come in the next slide. So just bear with me for now. So three sig figs, two sig figs. It says go with the least accurate linoleum. So I'm gonna go with the two significant figures. Since here we are doing division, we should report the result in two significant figures according to the rule. So I'm gonna take the least accurately known one. So now what I have to do is I have to write this number in two significant figures. So I'm gonna take these two numbers, but I have to look at the next one. If it's five or larger than five, then this number will be rounded up. So it will be two, because this is nine, it will be 2.5. So I'm just rounding up. So this is the answer. Now, what is the error? The error is 0 0.1 centimeter per second. Why? Because maybe here, this number is, you know, it could be, I'm not sure about this. So it could be one, it could be nine. So depending on what it is, this could be five or six. So there is some, little uncertainty on this number. So it's somewhere between 2.4 and 2.6. Okay, so we did the multiplication and division. So what about if we have to add or subtract uh, numbers with different significant figures? So now the rule is the result should have the same number of decimal places now. Let me go back one slide back. Here we were talking about number of significant figures, but now in addition and subtraction, we are talking about number of decimal places with that of the least accurately known quantity. Okay, let me give you again an example. Let's say you need to add two different time measurements done by two different clocks. So one of the clock is not very sensitive. It can only show you, um, uh, you know, the next decimal place here, only one decimal place. So it's, this is like, this is seconds, this is one tenth of second. But you have maybe another clock, which is more sensitive, which could uh, show you, uh, you know, the sensitivity is one hundredth of a second. So how do you combine these two? Because the sensitivities of these measurements are different. Okay, so if you do it in the calculator, 5.1 plus 16.74, the calculator will give you this. But according to the rule above, the result should have one decimal place. Why? This has one decimal place. This has two decimal places. So we go by the least accurate and known one. So we go by this one. So the result should be in one decimal point. So we should write this in one decimal point. So I'm gonna take one decimal point, but I should always look at the next one. It's four, so four doesn't round it up. So it's gonna be 21.8. Again, this number has uncertainty or the error of this much. Okay, so now let's talk about how we determine the number of significant figures. So there are two options. One, there are two cases. The first one is the decimal numbers that I'm gonna start with. The other one is the integer, integer numbers. So let's start with decimal numbers. If you have a decimal number, which means you have a decimal point and other digits. So the leading zeros are not significant figures. So when you count this numbers for significant figures, you are not going to count the leading zeros because they don't contribute to the number of significant figures. So what are leading zeros? Leading zeros are the, the zeros 
that are before the first non-zero number. So these are lead, called leading zeros. They come first, leading in that. So it means you know, coming first. So they're not significant figures. You don't count them. Other numbers, including the trailing zeros, are significant figures. So I'm going to count all the numbers. So one, two, three, four, five. And I'm also counting the trailing zeros. Uh, five, six, seven. So there are seven significant figures in this number, in this whole number. Now, why don't we count these? I mean, these are not, these are unimportant. No, these are of course important, but the leading zeros are not significant figures. They are not significant figures because they do not determine the precision. Remember, significant figures are related to precision. How, pre how precise do you know a quantity? So in fact, we can get rid of them by writing. So if you take the same number, if you write it as this, so, so I moved the point to one, two, two, three, to this point. So I moved the decimal point here. So then I have to multiply this by 10 to the negative third. Okay, I can write it like this. It's, these are the same number, exactly the same number, no difference, but you know, written in different form. So as you can see that I, I'm not changing anything in terms of the value, but I can just change, you know, I can get rid of these numbers so they cannot be significant figures. But what about the, the, the trailing zeros, the trailing that are coming after? So note that we don't get rid of the last zeros because they tell us about the precision of the number. So those zeros are significant figures, okay? So if you have a number like this, 7.5, and if you have a number like this, 7.50, okay? Point. Okay, this is less precise, but this one is more precise. So these zeros that are, which are called trailing zeros, are important. They actually tell us about precision, and because they tell us about precision, we cannot get rid of them. So they contribute to the count of significant figures. Okay, what happens if we change units? Well, if you change units, you know, changing units does not change the number of significant figures. Let's say you have a number like this, 0 0.400 meters. How many significant figures are there? Well, I don't count the zeros until the first non-zero number. So I'm gonna start from here, one, two, three significant numbers, significant figures. So, this is given in meters. If I want to convert it to kilometers, so one kilometer is 1,000 meters. So what I have to do is I have to move, so I need three zeros here just after the decimal point, right? So one, two, three. Now it's in kilometers, okay? But these are exactly the same number, right? These are equal to each other. So I just changed the unit and I got extra zeros here. But if I count the significant numbers again, one, two, three, still three significant figures, because changing the units does not change the precision. So accordingly, it doesn't change the number of significant figures. The number of leading zeros, which are, these are the leading zeros, change when we change the unit from meters to kilometers. But the number itself and its precision does not change with the change of units. Unit conversion don't change the precision of the measurement. So the number of significant figures don't change. Remember, significant figures quantify the precision. Okay, so we did the decimal, uh, we did the, uh, so decimal numbers. Now the second one is the integer numbers. So integer numbers, so this is an example. If you wanna calculate these significant figures, basically calculate these, so one, two, three, four, so four significant figures. But if you have um, 
when there's no decimal point, because this is an integer number, there's no decimal point, and when there are trailing zeros like this, then it's ambiguous. We don't know if how many significant figure this has. So it could be uh, 2,300, or I can read it as 2,300. It may mean two, three, or four significant figures. So this, this is a little bit ambiguous. This is fine, but this is ambiguous just because of these zeros. So to avoid this problem, you need to use something called scientific notation. Okay, what is scientific notation? It is basically writing numbers in this format. So basically you have the first number and it shouldn't be zero. It's none, it could be from one to nine. And then right after the first number, there should be the uh, decimal point. And then you can write the other numbers and you can write the multiplication sign and then tend to do some exponent. It could be positive or negative. So let's express 2300 meters with different sig figs. You can write it as 2.3 times 10 to the third meters. So how many significant figures here? One, two, you don't count the tens. So two significant figures. By the way, this number is again the same number. I'm not changing the number, I'm just rewriting it in scientific notation. Okay, so two significant figures. The error here is, you know, this could be this last decimal place. It could be four or it could be two, depending on the number here, which I don't know. So the uncertainty or the error is 0.1. So 0.1 times 10 to the third. So if you do this calculation, it's 100 meters. So when you measure 2300, this distance, meters, with a satellite with 10 meter sensitivity, then you would, uh, you would write the answer, the measurement, into significant figures. Okay, what about if I write again the same number, 2300, in three significant figures? Well, it, could, it will be one, two, three significant figures written like this. Again, it's the same number, okay? The only ch change is now it's in three sig figs. Now, what is error here? The error here will be 0 0.01, okay? And of course, I have to multiply by this, 1,000, so the error is 10 meters. So you have to notice one thing, the significant figures, if they increase, the error decreases. So less error, more significant figures, and this also means more precise. Now look at here, when you measure 2300 meters with a satellite with 10 meters sensitivity. So this is more precise. This is less precise. Okay, what about four sig figs? You can write it like this, one, two, three, four. And now the sensitivity is one meters. It's even, you know, it's way more sensitive than these. So there's less error and more sensitivity. Note that these are all the same number, 2300, but expressed in different sig figs to emphasize the precision or error in the measurement. Okay, let me give you an example. The question is, can we write 2300 in scientific notation as this or this? The answer is no. These don't adopt the scientific notation format given above. Why, what's the problem with this one? Well, the problem is it starts with zero. Here, the format says it shouldn't, the first number shouldn't be zero. So that's the problem here. What about the problem here? Well. Here, the decimal, plate, the decimal point comes after two digits, but according to the format, the decimal point should come after the first number. So that's the problem here, okay? So how would you cor correct this? Well, the first number should be this, two, and then the decimal point, 2.3 times 10, two. Now I moved point, decimal point here, 
So I have to multiply this. So I have to change the exponent. So I actually made it a larger number. So I have to decrease this by one. So it should be like this. Okay, what about this one? So again, 2.3. Okay, and so I actually decreased the number by a factor of 10. So I have to multiply it by, uh, so this should be third. Okay, so for 2300, write the first number two as I did here, then write the decimal point, then write the rest of the number depending on how many sig figs you want. So if you want two sig figs, it's like this. If you want three sig figs, it's one, two, three, like this. Significant figures are really, really important because when you do, let's say, online homeworks or exams, uh, the program, the online website, will want you to answer in specific significant figures like two sig figs, uh, three sig figs. So you have to get the sig figs right. Otherwise, the answer of your homework or exam will not be accepted by the system. Now I'm going to talk about how to run numbers. So if you have numbers like 1.10, 1 1.11, 1 goes like this up to 1.14, this second decimal place, if you are gonna round it up, so if you want to round these numbers, so if these numbers are one through four, then they don't round up. So it becomes 1.1. So if you round these numbers, you get 1.1. But if the last decimal digit or this one, second one, so five, six, seven, eight, or nine, then it rounds up. So these numbers are rounded up to 1.2. Okay, so we are gonna round pi up to a certain number of decimal places. So pi is an irrational number, so it goes to infinity. Here, I just printed uh, 200, first 200 digits of pi. So let's say if I want to round pi to one decimal place. So what I do is, so the one decimal place is this, but I have to look at the next decimal place. It's four, so according to this rule, it's not going to you know, round up, so it will be 3.1. So this is the answer. What about if I, want to round pi to two decimal places, then I have to take these two, two decimal places. This is the first decimal place, first decimal place, and this one is the second decimal place. But again, I have to look at the next one. It's one, again, according to this rule, it's just gonna, it's not going to round up, so it will be 3.14, like this. What about three decimal points? Pi up to three decimal uh, places. So I'm gonna take these three, and I have to look at the next one. It's five, so it will actually round up. So it will give me, so it will make this number two. So it's gonna be three, one, four, two, just like this. Okay, four decimal places finally. So I have to take four decimal places. The next one is nine, so it will round up. So it will give me 3.1416, this one. Okay, let's do these exercises. First, write this number in two sig figs. Okay, so two sig figs, well, I'm not gonna count this leading zero, they're not counted. So two sig figs, figs mean, these two numbers. So I'm gonna take these two numbers. The next number is five, so it's going to round up. So it will be 0 0.4, 0 .4, not zero, but one, because of that five. Okay, let's do this one. Again, two sig figs. So these don't count, so these are significant figures here. Now I'm gonna look at the next one. Well, it's four, it's not going to round up, so it'll be 0 0.040. Okay, what about this? Uh, by the way, you can also write these in um, scientific notation, that's fine. So if you wanna write it 
scientific notation. Now it should be first start with some number, not zero. So 4.1, okay, and times 10 to, so I uh, increase the number by a number of 10. So I have to add negative one here to compensate. So these are both equal and they are both in two significant figures. This is just the scientific notation. This one is in scientific notation, but both are okay. Okay, now let's write this in two sig figs. So I have to start counting from here, one, two. So I'm gonna take these numbers. Four doesn't round, round them up, so it will be 1.0. Okay, let's write this in two sig figs. So the sig figs, so I don't count to zero, leading zero. So now look at the next one, six, it's going to carry one here. So this will be 10. So I'm going to write zero here and that one will carry over here. And this also will, it's going to be 10. So it's going to be zero here and one here. So it will be 1.0. Well, it says two significant figures. So I'm going to stop here. So 1.0. Now let's write this in this number in two sig figs. Well, I can't really take these, only this part, right? Because this is 105.3. So there is the only way to write this in significant with two sig figs is writing it in uh, scientific notation. Okay, so so I'm going to start with one, and then I have to put the decimal point, and I have to put another number here times ten. So there's going to be some exponent. So I can only put one more number because it says two sig figs. So that number is it going to be zero or one? Well, look at there's five. So this is gonna be round up, so it's gonna be one because of the five. Okay. So I move this decimal point here and then here. So what I have to do is I have to multiply by 10 to the second. So if you do the multiplication, it's like 110, which is close to this one. Okay, so this is basically this number written in two significant figures in scientific notation. Okay, how do you write this in scientific notation? Well, what's the problem? The problem is zero. It cannot start with zero in scientific notation. So it should start with five. Okay, and, and then I'm gonna write five times 10 to, so I increased it by a factor of 10, so I have to add another negative one here, so it's gonna be negative three. Okay, if you wanna write this in scientific notation, this is missing a decimal point, so I should do 2.2 times 10 to the second. Okay, if you ever have doubts about your calculations in terms of like when you calculate significant figures and if you are not sure, you can always use this calculator online. It's called Omni Calculator. If you go to this link here, uh, you can put the number here and then it will tell you how many significant figures are there in, this, in that number. So here this E8, it actually means exponent eight. So it's like what this means is times 10 to the eight, okay? So how many significant figures are there? We don't count the leading zeros, so count one, two. So there are two significant figures, which is given correctly here. Okay, let's do some conversion. How do we convert units? The first exercise is convert four feet to meters. Now this conversion is given, one meter is 3.281 feet. So, what I do is I first write four feet, okay? Now, I'm gonna substitute feet with something else. So, I have to find what feet here is. So, what I can do is, so imagine there is, let me put a line here. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this number and put it here in the denominator. Or in other words, what I'm gonna do is, 
I'm going to divide both sides with this number. 3.281, 3.281. So these cancel each other. So I got this one. So from here, I can, so you can write feet equals one meter divided by 3.281. Okay, now instead of feet in this equation here, I'm gonna substitute this thing, okay? So you can see that here, okay? Now you can rewrite it as four divided by this number times meter. I just took the meters out. And then if you do the calculation, it gives you 1.22 meters. You can use this trick all the time and find the, do the conversion easily. Let's do this one. So express 40 miles per hour. So this slash, it also means per in SI units. So what are SI units uh, for distance? It's meters for time, it's seconds. So we have to convert this 40 MPH to meters per second. And one mile is 16, Oh, nine meters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write 40 miles per hour. Okay. So for miles, I'm going to write this thing in terms of meter, 1609 meters divided by for hour. I'm going to convert. So I have to convert hours to seconds. So instead of hour, I can write 60 times 60 seconds, right? In one hour, there is uh, 300, sorry, 3,600 seconds. So you can see that now I got meter per second. So just do the calculation, this calculation by using your calculator, and it gives you 17.9, and what's left here is the units, meter per second. So that's the answer. Now we move to order of magnitude calculations. So we're gonna talk about rough estimates. That's very important for scientists and engineers. Um, so sometimes you need to test an idea quickly uh, without really doing long calculations. You know, on the spot you can do uh, quick calculations and they're really important. Uh, to quickly test an idea, you need to be able to quickly make rough estimates before more detailed and precise calculations. So order of magnitude is, so that's a, that's a definition, that's a term. It means the power of 10 that is closest to a quantity. For example, 123. So is it close to 100 or is it close to 1,000? Well, it's close to 100, right? So then it has order of magnitude 3, 1, 2, 3. Okay, what about 9? Hundred and ninety-eight. So these are, you know, they have the same number of digits, but this one is close to not hundred, but it's close to thousand, right? So it has one, two, three, four, order of magnitude four. What about this number? Two hundred and fifty thousand. Is it close to one million or is it close to one hundred thousand? Well, it's close to one hundred thousand. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So it has the order of magnitude is six. So how do you use this in, in a sentence? You hear people say, for example, I earn $100,000 per year and he earns 1 million per year. He earned one order of magnitude more than me. So that's one example of uh, using this term, order of magnitude. So when you need a ballpark estimate, you can assume cows are like a sphere or rectangular box. That's a joke also in physics. Uh, you know, when you make, uh, before making a rough estimate or order of magnitude estimate, you would say, okay, assume cows are spherical. And in fact, in the next slide, we're gonna do such calculation. So, Let's say someone asks you, how many cows can fit in your bedroom? Of course, that's not, you know, in real life, you would probably um, 
consider the question, how many cows can fit in a farm in, or in a, in a field or in a you know, truck to transfer them from some place to another place? So, but let's, let's consider our bedroom. So the question is, well, we're not really asking the exact number, but you know, just give us some rough estimate, you know, some uh, ballpark estimate or some order of magnitude estimate. So is it like 100, is it 1,000, is it 10,000? So you know, that's the aim of these calculations. So we need a ballpark estimate. So assume that a cow is like a rectangular box. So that's, I'm assuming, making this assumption just to be able to make simple calculations. So, and then, so this cow is, you know, it's really hard to find its volume, right? So if I know the volume of the room, or if I can estimate it, which I can easily, right? So what you have to do is you have to multiply um, the width and uh, the height and the depth of your room. Okay, you have to multiply those in meters. And then you have to also find the volume of this box. And if you do this division, it's going, it's going to give you how many cows, uh, the, the number of cows. Of course, it's going to be an estimate. So now, but to, to be able to find the volume of a cow, it's really, it's, you know, its shape is not really a simple uh, geometrical object. So I have to make an assumption. So I'm going to assume that this cow is a rectangular box. So uh, this part of the leg, I'm going to ignore it and I will assume it's here and this part of the legs are you know, folded here. So I'm going to erase this. So the head, maybe it can fit here. So I will erase this part. So now I can think the cow is kind of like a rectangular, uh, rectangular prism. Okay, so this is the cow and this is the model of the cow. So now you have to do some estimates. Well, the cow maybe, I'm just making this up, maybe two meters, you know, you don't have to be exact. Maybe the width is, I'm guessing 0 0.7 meters and maybe height is this height, not the hole with the legs, but this, this height, it could be one meters. So the volume would be, you know, multiply all these numbers in meters. So it's going to be 1.4 meter cube. Now take this number and then you know, make an estimate about the volume of your room and then uh, calculate the number of cows that, that can fit in your bedroom. Okay, here's another example. How many times do you blink in a year? Okay, what you can do is, okay, you don't know how many times you blink in a second or in a minute, right? but you can make an estimate, you can guess, or you can actually uh, count how many times you blink in 15 seconds. Now you can pause the video here if you want and count how many times you blink in 15 seconds. So I counted like seven, it could be a little bit less, it could be a little bit more, but it's not definitely one, right? And it's also not 100. So it's some number, you know, between one and 100. And so this is for 15 seconds, multiply this number by four, you will find number of blinks per minute, which I found 28. And multiply this by 60, you will find number of blinks per hour, and also multiply by 24, then you will find number of blinks per day, which is this number, okay? And if you finally multiply that number with 300, in 65, you will find how many number you, you will find the number of blinks per year, which I found 15 million. Of course, this is an estimate. Okay, let me tell you about just quickly scalars and vectors. It's also a definition. Scalar means a quantity with just a numerical value but no direction. So examples are distance traveled, 10 meters. Speed 300, uh, sorry, three uh, meter per second. It doesn't really have any direction, just number. Or temperature, you know, 30 degrees. So these are examples to scalars. What about vector? Vectors, are, they have 
uh, there are quantities with both magnitude, which means these numbers, numerical values, and also the direction. For example, the displacement is 10 kilometers north. So there's this number, the magnitude, and there's also the direction. The force could be 20 Newton, 20 Newtons downward. So it is, so it has a direction and it also has a value. So these are vectors. Also velocity is a vector. Now speed is a scalar, just a number, but velocity, it's, it's the number and also its direction. Okay, some guidelines for solving physics problems. First, you have to read the problem carefully. And then sketch the system. So, I mean, draw the figures, like if you have a box and an incline, it's sliding down or not, or there's gonna be some, you know, there are some forces on it. So draw all the forces and everything, like as much as you can draw. Visualize the physical process, what's going on. Like if it's staying like this, what are the things that keeps it here? Maybe there's some friction force. Okay, and strategize. Usually there are many ways to solve the same problem, but some of the ways are quicker. So you have to find the way that gives you, gives you the answer quickest. And identify the appropriate equations. Are you gonna use uh, F equals MA to solve this problem? Or are you gonna use the kinematics equation? So you have to determine the equations and you have to solve the equations. Now, this final step is important. You have to check if your answers make sense, okay? Let's say you calculated, uh, you, made, you made an estimate on how many cows can fit in your bedroom. If you're finding one million, that doesn't make sense, right? One million cows in a bedroom doesn't make sense. So you have to, so probably you are, most probably you are making some mistakes in the calculations. So always check your answers if they make sense. Okay, finally, problem solving in physics. So what you have to do is you have to be, so you have to extract the relevant information from the problem and you have to discard the irrelevant parts. For example, if you are given this problem, a tortoise races a rabbit by walking with a constant speed of 2.51 centimeters per second for 12.23 seconds while the rabbit is eating a carrot. How far does the tortoise go? So what are the relevant informations here? Well, it says constant speed. That means I'm gonna use this equation. And also the velocity is given, the time is given, so I'm gonna use these, okay? But is this relevant if the rabbit is eating a carrot? No. Even that, this is a rabbit, this is a tortoise, they are not even relevant, right? So it could be any object, it could be a car, it could be, so what matters is there's some object here, This for tortoise, it has some velocity, okay? For some time, there's some time, it goes the distance x. So the question is, what is this x? So it doesn't really matter. Now we can get rid of this figure because it's confusing. Now we can just, you know, go with this, with these and, you know, just use the formula and make the calculations. Okay, that's all for this lecture.